This 185,000 pound tower is being moved into position over a deep hole recently drilled into the alluvium of the Atomic Energy Commission's Nevada test site. The detonation of a nuclear explosive device located at the bottom of this hole will produce a large neutron flux. During this test, codenamed persimmon, material samples in the tower will be exposed to the neutrons, yielding data vital to understanding the nuclear properties of the various materials. This cutaway drawing shows the testing arrangement for a typical nuclear weapons physics experiment. The basic argument in favor of such experiments is that a relatively small nuclear detonation will produce the same quantity of neutrons in a fraction of a second that would take a laboratory accelerator hundreds of years to produce. Thus experiments requiring a very high neutron flux become feasible with a nuclear explosion as the source of neutrons. One such experiment requires samples whose inherent radioactivity is so great that an enormous flux is needed for the detector to separate data from the sample background. And another type uses very small samples of rare isotopes, requiring a hopelessly long running time on an accelerator. The nuclear device is positioned about 1,000 feet underground. At zero time, an evacuated pipe from the device to just below the tower will provide an unobstructed path for the neutrons. Radioactive gases and debris from the detonation will be kept from reaching the surface by a series of proven high-speed closure mechanisms. The vacuum pipe was fabricated in a number of small sections. Each section, beginning with one couple to the rack holding the device, was lowered its length into the hole, joined to another section, and lowering continued. With the final section in place, the completed pipe string was carefully checked for alignment and any necessary adjustments made to ensure a straight path for the neutron beam. The tower was then moved into position. The main beam will be divided into four separate beams by this beam splitter on the ground floor of the tower giving each floor its own neutron source. An experiment called the wheel will be installed directly above the beam splitter. From this narrow slit, part of the beam will be directed to the wheel surface of fissile material while the wheel spins at a high rate of speed. The long thin beam of neutrons will strike the wheel along a radius. Neutrons of greatest energy will arrive first, followed by those of lower energy. Fissions of different energies, therefore, will be produced in different areas on the wheel's surface, which will be defined by the specific time after zero during which these areas will be exposed to the beam. A few seconds after detonation, the entire experiment, mounted on a sled, will be pulled out and away from the tower by a winch and cable arrangement avoiding a fall into the crater that will form at ground zero following the explosion. Radiochemical analysis of the wheel will be performed in Los Alamos. The second floor of the tower houses an experiment that will simultaneously measure the neutron fission cross-sections of plutonium-238, uranium-235, americium-243, and curium-244. Neutron capture cross-sections will be determined for promethium-147 and plutonium-238. The detectors and auxiliary testing apparatus, mounted on a sled, will be pulled out of the tower and down this ramp shortly after detonation. Along with the cross-section samples housed in this package, several samples of lithium-6 were included to monitor the neutron flux. The neutron beam will pass through here, at the rear of the sled. This model shows a typical sample detector arrangement. In the test, the beam will hit the sample, and the resultant fission fragments will strike detectors, generating current in an amount proportional to the reaction rate. The fission fragment detectors will be placed at angles of 15 degrees, 55 degrees, and 90 degrees from the foils safely outside the three-quarter inch diameter circular neutron beam. 
Detector signals will be transmitted to and read out on remote oscilloscopes. The foils will be centered in the beam a few inches below the detectors. A total of 66 detectors were used. Camera shutters will isolate detectors from some samples in order to prevent damage that could be caused by the intense alpha particle bombardment from these foils. These shutters will be opened one second before zero to give the detectors an unimpeded view of the foils. The Promethium-147 sample will be housed in this lead container until 15 seconds before zero, when it will be automatically placed into position. The lead shield protects workers as well as the detectors from intense gamma rays. This sample handling equipment was built at the National Reactor Test Site in Idaho, where short-lived, highly radioactive samples can be prepared, flown quickly to the Nevada test site, and safely placed into position. In order to handle the range of detector output currents that extends from one ampere down to a ten thousandth of an ampere, these five decade logarithmic amplifiers were designed at the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. They cover the range from zero to one millivolt as an almost linear amplifier, and from ten millivolts to one hundred volts, the response is logarithmic. One can therefore read signals as low as one millivolt or less and as high as 100 volts with one oscilloscope sensitivity setting. The amplified detector signals will be transmitted down cables from the tower to an instrumentation trailer located beyond the expected outer perimeter of the crater. The signal will be received on these oscilloscopes. A photographic record of the signal amplitude, which is proportional to the reaction rate of the sample, will provide an efficient means of data recording and storage. To cover the flight time from source to experiment of the 10 million electron volt to 10 electron volt neutrons generated in the nuclear detonation, data must be recorded for about 10 milliseconds, and early data must have a one-tenth of a microsecond resolution. Data will be recorded on these 35 millimeter moving film street cameras. These cameras will operate at a film speed of 100 feet per second while photographing scopes with cathode ray tubes coated with very fast decaying phosphors. Photography of early data will also be accomplished by this high speed drum camera that records many oscilloscope traces on one piece of film several feet long. The drum, with film on the inside surface, will be rotating at 10,000 revolutions per minute at zero time, and will photograph the scopes mounted on the opposite wall, providing a sharp record of the early electronic impulses. In another instrumentation trailer, the early data will be recorded by these still photograph plate cameras that cover only a few millionths of a second. The remaining floors of the persimmon tower contain experiments dealing with several different methods of neutron effect studies. The experiment on the third floor will measure neutron capture in europium-151 and 153, lutetium-175, and niobium-93. These samples mounted inside this pipe through which the neutron beam will pass are accompanied by six lithium-6 samples to measure the neutron flux and an yttrium sample to measure neutronic background. A total of 21 detectors will observe these samples. Their amplified signals will be read out on scopes in the instrumentation complex and the scope traces recorded by photography. This experiment on the fourth floor of the tower is concerned with neutron scattering measurements. Two material samples have been placed in the neutron beam pipe. The sample behind this metallic window is thorium-232, and behind this top window is a sample of bismuth-209. A total of 18 detectors are placed at a variety of angles and distances from the windows. 
The various angles will help to identify the particular energies or resonances of the neutrons where they tend to have a greatly enlarged scattering cross-section, while very distances from the windows will allow the gamma rays to be separated from the neutrons. Since the relatively slow neutrons will take a longer time to travel from sample to detector than the very rapid gammas. These detectors have proven to be considerably more efficient in the detection of neutrons than those used in previous tests because of their relative insensitivity to gamma rays. This cell is filled at a pressure of 3,500 pounds per square inch with helium-3 at a density about half that of liquid helium-3. When a scattered neutron strikes an atom of helium in the cell, nearly one million electron volts of energy will be released. This energy will produce light in a scintillator and the detector will transform it into an electrical impulse that will then be amplified. This signal will be sent to the instrumentation complex to be read as a pulse on an oscilloscope and the pulse will be recorded by high-speed cameras. Gamma detectors were housed in this cubicle on the roof of the tower. These detectors will determine when the first gamma rays arrive. Because the gammas will precede the neutrons up the pipe, their arrival at the roof will serve as a signal to start recording systems and auxiliary equipment. They will also provide a time reference on the scopes by leaving a pulse that is photographically recorded. Finally, February 23rd, 1967, shot day. At the control point several miles from ground zero, a computer program is in control of the electronic firing equipment as the countdown nears zero. At the instrumentation complex, great quantities of data have been automatically recorded. The photographic records remain to be retrieved and processed, and this will be followed by months of data reduction and computation before final information is obtained. But the experiment time is short when compared with the time required to achieve the same results by more familiar laboratory methods, and more importantly, some of the measurements could not have been made at all with laboratory neutron sources. Hundreds of feet beneath the tower, a bubble of molten earth and gaseous bomb debris has been formed in the blast cavity. It is kept from reaching the surface by a series of closure mechanisms in the pipe. As the bubble cools, a process taking anywhere from several minutes to several hours, the pressure supporting the earth above the cavity is reduced, the earth fractures, and finally collapses, forming a crater at ground zero. Although the tower is structurally damaged, most of the equipment inside is reusable and will be recovered. The experiments discussed in this report will lead to the development of techniques for handling extremely intense beams of neutrons and the performance of precision experiments with them. They will also provide data that will become the basic design parameters in future nuclear technology. <laughs>